Welcome to Biztex Investor Conversation Show. Hi, I'm Brian Fernandez, and our guest today has been on Biztex Asia two years ago. And since then, this company has grown by leaps and bounds. Now, he is Murali Ravi. He's the co-founder of Tinman Capital. Tinman Capital is a venture capital firm that exclusively focuses on B2B tech startups with Southeast Asia as their primary market of interest. Now, the firm focuses on enterprise technology segments with large and growing total addressable markets in the region. Now, to give us more insights and to update us on in key industry trends, Morley, great to have you back on the show. Thank you. Now, as I said in the start, it's been about two years since our last conversation. Could you share with us some key milestones and, and, and achievements of Tin Man Capitals in the last two years? Much appreciate that. And thank you for having me. When we first spoke, I think we had a lot of ideas as to what we wanted to invest in, where we think we would be successful and so on. Uh, I've done investing for quite a long time. So as my co-founder, I've been in venture capital since 2008. Having said that, though, this firm that we co-founded, you know, my partner Jeremy and I, it's still viewed by a potentially independent third parties as a new uh, exercise, right? Something new that we haven't done before. So we had to prove ourselves, uh, which also meant that we had a lot of theories and data, but not necessarily results and actual you know, validation by, by market uh, trends. So when we spoke two years ago, we had all the ideas that you just very quickly summarized you know, kindly for me, which was around enterprise tech, Southeast Asian companies, large markets, and so on, right? That Theory, actually, what's changed or what's the update in the last two years is that theory has been borne out, you know, quite successfully, I, I would argue. Uh, one aspect that I was actually surprised by is that when we were first doing it, a lot of people basically looked at us and said, look, you guys are, well, to be polite, I think the polite words used were, this is idiotic, right? You should be going out to the big consumer markets. You should be investing in large e-commerce companies or and so on and so forth, those kind of opportunities. Because that was the thesis for 90% of a lot of your, your That's peers. Right. That's right. That's right. And we basically said, um, fine, you know, you guys do that. Please be happy doing that. But that's not where we play, in part because that's not our prior experience. So you want to be where you are actually good at what you do, right? Not simply follow the crowd simply because everyone else is doing the same thing. So that was one aspect. Second thing is actually fundamentally, we had a difference of opinion as to what successful investing looks like. And that is the part that I think we've been gratified to see has actually come to fruition. And let me expand on that bit. The main point there was we said, traditional industries in Southeast Asia. So think agriculture, logistics, uh, construction, shipping, so on and so forth. These are large industries for Southeast Asia. Our thesis was these guys are actually digitizing and they need technology. Southeast Asia is, of course, well known as being one of the high growth economies in the world. But yet the large tech companies don't come here as the first point of call, right? You'll be starting with the US, maybe you go to Europe, Canada, other places. At some point you go to China, maybe India. Southeast Asia is the afterthought after all of that, right? So there's an opportunity for homegrown companies to say, look, I can serve my local market and do some of those things. Number two aspect, which people actually disagreed with us, probably even more strongly, was unlike the consumer space that you rightly said 90% of people were focusing on, here, you could actually build companies of significance without raising pots and pots of capital. Why? Because they are customer funded. Customer funded and high margin, right? So typically, uh, the companies that we invest in, these enterprise software companies, have margins in the range of 70 to 90 plus percent, right? Gross margins, which means as an implication of this, that you don't need to build a very large company in order to get to profitability. You also don't need to raise huge amounts of capital to get to actually sustainability. So let's say an average of between five and $10 million of ARR, so annualized recurring revenue, is sufficient for you to actually stand on your own two feet. This doesn't mean that you don't raise more money, right? But it gives you the option. Now, when we were talking about all this, you know, four, five, six years ago, money basically looked free, right? No one worried about saying, look, I need to stand on my own two feet, otherwise I'll fall flat, right? And that wasn't our focus. We went looking for entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs came and sought us who were of a different, you know, uh, type. 
So those are the good partners for us and we are the good partners for them where we have a company in our portfolio, which is more than 10 years old. They've raised 5 million US dollars over the life of the company. They're the largest in the sector for Asia PAC, right? So they're not a small company, they're the largest in the sector. And yet, you know, this is the tiny amount of money that they raised, right? Where, and they're profitable could, today. Can you share the name of that company? Sure, sure. There's a company called Global Tix. It's a travel software company based mm -hmm. out of Singapore, but uh, operations across all of Asia. When we invested, they had only two offices, technically two offices, but really one office. The Singapore was the headquarters. Uh, they had a small back office in Indonesia. Now they have nine offices that are around the entire region. And as I said, raise very little capital and they're profitable, right? So now the world is their oyster. They can actually choose to say, look, I want to go do ABC and I have the choice to do so or choice to you know, hold back if I choose to. It's completely up to them, which is kind of the great place for us to be. Now, why did I bring up this example is because two years ago, even when we spoke, money was still flowing, right? Yes, it was starting to slightly tighten, but it was still flowing. Fast forward, you know, a year or two later, money is completely stopped. A lot of investors who you said were looking at primarily B2C and sort of throwing money down into uh, pits where it just gets burnt away, that side has completely changed, right? There are a lot of companies who have suffered, who potentially can go out of business, who have actually gone out of business and so on, simply because they had not thought through the unit economics from day one. They were simply focused on acquiring customers or acquiring users without much regard for, is this a good customer? Can I make money off this? Will I be around for the long term? How much capital do I need? Those sorts of things. That mood has completely changed. And I'm pleased to see that our portfolio remains of the disciplined sort where, yes, you can occasionally find that they have stumbles along the way, but not one of them will have a human economic situation which doesn't make financial sense. And also, again, for you, because of that lens, um, that's one of the reasons why most of them, I'm sure, if not all of them, are still alive and thriving in this market because in a market where there's no money, you've got to basically survive on, the, on your own two feet. Correct. And I Correct. remember you you mentioned that you had about, a, a, at that time, about eight startups uh, that you worked with. Um, how has that panned out in terms of, does this fit, fit the natural venture capital model where basically two or three work out decently, two or three are okay, the rest of them are not doing so well. What's your track record looking like? Yeah, uh, actually in the first fund, which we launched in 2018, we had seven companies. And the second fund was launched uh, less than two years ago, which we've had already now four companies. Uh, the typical failure rate for, let's say, Series A focused uh, venture capital funds like ours, I would say after, let's say year four, year five, by then things have shaken out. You should have a decent idea how many of them are going to succeed or not. So the average, I would say, in the industry is between 30 to 60% of your portfolio will be written off. Okay. That's a typical market standard. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just the name of the game, right? Yeah. Ours, we modeled out a failure rate of 50%. It turned out that we have a failure rate of 3% so far. Okay. So it's almost like a credit portfolio as if you're, you're lending money, right? Okay. That's on the downside. On the upside, our returns are similar to any other venture firm, uh, venture firm. And the reason for this is because coming back to the unit economics, but also the kind of uh, act, you know, active uh, involvement that we have with these companies, where if you just put in money, you can do a certain amount of things. If you're a B2C company, really all you need your investors to do is to give you lots of money, maybe help you a bit with hiring and governance. And, and that's it, right? The entrepreneurs run the business. They're the ones signing up the user or signing up, let's say if you're, if you're running a ride sharing company, signing up drivers and so on. Your investors are not going to help you sign up drivers, yeah. right? But for B2B, especially enterprise-focused B2B, we can bring in potentially customers from another geography. We can help bring them, you know, advisors. We can help bring them uh, partners, strategic partners, you know, go-to-market partners, so on and so forth. Each and of I those... remember our conversation, Morley, and I hate to interject at this Please. point, but I remember you mentioning quite clearly we're almost like a hybrid VCP firm. That's because right. Because we are really active in helping. And so this has obviously played out quite nicely. Yeah, so far it's played out. You know, fingers crossed it'll continue to play out. Uh, and the other aspect of PE, you know, thanks for that reminder, is concentrated portfolio, right? Now, this has happened partly by design, partly also self-reinforcing. What do I mean by that? Partly by design meaning... If I actually believe that I can help all these companies, I cannot do it for 
30, 40, 50, 60, 100 companies, right? It's just physically not possible. So therefore you build in a concentrated portfolio, right? When I say it's also self-reinforcing, what I mean by that is our health actually helps some of these companies get to a certain stage, or at the very least stay default alive, which then actually attracts the same kind of entrepreneur to us. And we don't need to write two checks a month or two checks even a quarter, right? We are quite deliberate in what we do. Therefore, we can also self-select into the kind of entrepreneur that we feel we are a good match for, and they feel they're a good match for us, right? So this is becoming self-reinforcing in that regard as well. Not just the business model, but the types of people who approach us and want to partner with us. Now, one of the things that's, and, and again, looking back to your thesis around Southeast Asia, that was not an outlier thesis in terms of Southeast Asia. A lot of money was attracted to Southeast Asia. But I think a lot of people realized much later, who, in terms of money that came out of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia is not one market. Southeast, yes. Asia, Southeast Asia is a diverse 10, 11, 12, you know, 10 markets, basically. Yes. Um, give us a sense of how your investments have played out across the region. Because one of the interesting things, and, and this is how we reconnected, obviously, at a conference in Malaysia, yes. and you had never mentioned Malaysia in your your, your the, the, the interview, yet you said, hey, we've got a lot of operational, and most of our companies have operations in Malaysia and are doing well. Walk us through how that evolution happened. Yeah, I wouldn't even call it an evolution. It was always in the plan to the extent okay. that what I would say is, when I say, let's say you're doing a company for the shipping industry, shipping is not an industry of just one country, right? Very obviously, ships go from one country to another country, Yes. right? So by definition, these are, these are companies that are touching multiple countries. And shipping is just one example. The same thing applies to agriculture. Same thing applies to pretty much manufacturing, so on and so forth. These are all cross-border, right? The previous point we just talked about, which is active involvement of the companies, that not only requires we have few companies, it also requires us to have proximity, right? Yes. So yes, I'm interested in capturing the opportunity in the Philippines market, but can I directly invest in a Filipino company and be sure that we have direct access and ongoing access to each other, right? Both sides having access to the extent that we feel is needed, right? We talk to our companies approximately once every four or five days, right? Not once every quarter, right? So that kind of active involvement, you need proximity. But at the same time, you don't want to let go of the opportunity of those what those markets can bring. So how do you capture sort of best of both worlds? Let's take another company in our portfolio. There's a firm called Hubble, which is in the construction technology space. They're based in Singapore. Okay. But they have presence in, in Malaysia, right? So they've been actually doing actively, you know, working with customers there. We brought in investors from Malaysia into that company who are strategic investors, not purely financial, right? So those can also help, you know, locally. We brought in even potentially some customers to some of our other companies, right? From Malaysia, but also from other, you know, countries in the region. So that's how we get access to the what I call the GDP of the entire region. Fragmentation has another aspect to it, which we haven't really talked about, which is a lot of people ask us about exit, right? And it's actually a very, very important question. We think about it all the time. There's been a thesis that Southeast Asia, large market, people can go and do IPOs after they get to a certain size. And I think that thesis is generally not true. It's true for very, very small number of cases. Take companies like Grab as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. Once you've got to very large scale, yes, you can go do that. But by and large, if you're below a certain amount, you're not going to be able to list in the US or maybe even Hong Kong, right? And uh, despite being Singaporean based in Singapore, I don't think SGX yes, yet has that ability to be the regional exchange. They're trying to be, and I wish them all you know, the, the more power to them. And I'd be happy to help them in whatever way I can. But today they're not there. So you've got to build companies that actually are interesting to acquirers. Now, why would an acquirer come in? Comes back to your previous point, because the markets are fragmented. Yes. If I'm a large French company, for example, or a large Chinese company, for example, and I want to expand into Southeast Asia, I've got two choices. Either I can go set up operations in all these countries and start to grow organically, or I can just buy one and just basically get a kickstart on it, right? A head start exactly. on it. So that's what we're increasingly seeing. This again ties in with sort of the very large companies versus the mid-sized companies that we're looking for. If you get to very large, the number of acquirers also shrinks, right? So again, your exits are limited. Whereas if you are of a reasonable size, and when I say reasonable, what I mean is, let's say valuation terms, 
200 to four five hundred million dollars in in valuation. These are companies that are viable by very very many players across the the world even who are interested in coming to Southeast Asia. Right. So those but are the important I, aspects. One of the things is and and and. I agree with you on one hand, but on the other hand, empirical evidence in in the MA space in the last couple of years in Southeast Asia tells us that there's not a lot of MAs. In, so we've done some research on this actually. MA has actually grown 5x in the last couple of years. Okay. Off a low base, no doubt. Yes. But it's grown 5x, specifically in the sectors that we invested. So B2B SaaS. Okay. So so in other words, the numbers are still small, but then they, they're basically growing at an exponential rate. Correct. Now, you've got some standout companies in your, your portfolio. I'm sure you're excited about. You've got uh, Manuva in Indonesia. You Tell us about AI Palette as well. That's another exciting company. Sure. Maybe I'll, I'll focus on a company which is more recent and then a company which is from, you know, been longer in the uh, in the portfolio because those will give you and your viewers, you know, different okay. perspectives. Let's take one of the newer ones. Maybe I'll take the newest one, if you don't mind, which is a company called iLytics. And thank you for plugging Manuva and AI Palette. Okay. But I'm going to use the opportunity to plug a third company. Okay. Right. So iLytics or AI Lytics is a video analytics AI company based out of Singapore. Okay? okay. So they're a company that takes video data and helps companies in uh, basically heavy industry improve their operations. Okay. So heavy industry means things like construction, shipbuilding, manufacturing, so on and so forth, okay? So what they basically do is all these industries, they've got uh, cameras, CCTV cameras on site for security reasons, right? Yeah. They are basically saying, can I use that data to help improve productivity or in other cases, help improve compliance with regulation, safety, uh, those sorts of things, right? Okay. In the construction industry, as an example, which is where they got started and they're now spread out to other industries, there's been mandating that by regulators that you need to not only record uh, you know, safety incidents and so on to ensure compliance, but you need to be able to produce it as well as hopefully prevent safety incidents from happening, right? And now it's become mandated. In the past was you know, a, a sort of a strong recommendation, let's call it that, but now it's become you know, much more important than that. What these guys are able to do is, despite it being a crowded space, right? Video analytics is not a new space they've been able to stand out because their accuracy is far, far higher than the other competitors out there, uh, which has been proved several times over by even skeptical clients who said, look, I've already got something in place. I'm not interested. It's also been proved because on the ground, if you think about a construction foreman, right, the other, let's call them competitors who are out there, very often their systems will generate false alarms. Okay. So you'll we'll say someone is actually in an unsafe area. Okay. And actually it was false because maybe it was just a bird flying by and thing flagged it as a human. Or it, it showed that this person is very close to a heavy object, but actually the heavy object is behind the wall and the system couldn't realize that there was a wall there, right? So iLithic software is actually able to figure out all these kinds of things. It's able to actually customize to a specific customer's needs without actually doing a custom job, right? Because they've got various switches they can turn on and off and so on. So on the ground, people who are otherwise sort of fed up with getting false alarms, and would actually manually turn off the system, right? Which breaches the law. Uh, now they're actually using it and saying, actually, this is useful. It's not giving me false alarms. It also is not forgetting the genuine alarm situations, which could happen if your system was not properly designed. This is one great example. They moved into another sector called manufacturing because another you know, company out there came to them and said, look, you've never worked in the manufacturing environment. We know that, but we did some essentially web searches and we heard about you please come and see whether you can install something like this in our controlled you know, factory environment. And factories, in this particular case, it's a steel industry uh, player, very dangerous environment, right? Because it's incredibly hot, people's hands are full, so they can't actually touch buttons and things like this. So everything has to be automated. And our guys were able to go and solve the problem. So now, being despite being a very small company, they're in Singapore, Hong Kong, they're the leaders. They're going to the Middle East. Soon they'll be in other countries. So you can clearly see that it's not just Southeast Asia has this problem in this particular case, but actually going even outside Southeast Asia. Yeah. So this is a recent, uh, the most recent uh, investment in our portfolio, which we invested in a couple of months ago, right? If you like, what I can sort of ticket size was that investment? Yeah, so all our companies, on average, we write maybe a $3 million check. These are US dollars. 
of course, we have a range. You know, we can do as low as a million dollars, sometimes even a little bit less than that, but preferably not. And the max first check would be maybe $4 million. We also reserve a lot of money for follow-ons because uh, we believe that if a company is doing well and they need to raise more money, we'd like to be the first ones in line to be able to give them that money, right? Why would I let it go to somebody else? Yes. Now, tell us about some of your exits then. Um, IVS obviously is, is something that stands out on your website, but perhaps you can tell us more that you may have in the pipeline. Sure, sure. So there are two kinds of exit, right? So the one kind of exit is uh, after a while, it's clear that it's not working out for whatever reason. And then there's the one who are definitely going to be the winners, right? As a matter of uh, simple, I guess, time management and priorities, et cetera, you want to make sure that if there's something that's actually not working out, move quickly from there, right? Do right by everybody, but move quickly from there uh, and spend your time on the ones that actually will move the needle for your investors and move the needle for your fellow you know, shareholders, for the founders, et cetera. In the IVS case, uh, this was just when the market had suddenly shrunk. Uh, IVS, as a, as a reminder to your audience, is a company that was doing marketing uh, software uh, via video for publishers across Southeast Asia. In the period roughly about two years ago, that entire market suddenly came to a shuddering halt, okay? Because mm -hmm. advertisers, meaning the large ones, your, your Disney's of the world and the PNG's of the world, suddenly said, hang on a second, inflation has just hit us. We are going to now be more careful about where we spend money, et cetera. Uh, and potentially even just take a step back for a bit and just think for a while, sit on our hands for a while, right? This was such a big thing that it not just hit small companies like IVS, but even the largest. So YouTube, I think for the first time ever in their history had a contraction of revenue, right? And that's a big story, right? That's the biggest video platform in the world and they had a contraction. So you can imagine it's much smaller players were much, much harder hit. So at that point we took the decision that actually it makes sense for us to see what we can do to salvage at this point, because we just weren't getting uh, additional sort of positive trend lines there. And we were fortunate that we were approached by another party who wanted to buy the company uh, for the very reason we talked about earlier. They wanted to enter Asia back. So we said, great, let's sort of uh, join hands and let's go. And that company is much larger than, than IDS itself. So what we did heroes. was, sorry? Show Heroes. That's right, that's right. So Show, show Heroes, you could say roughly it's 100 times the size of IVS, right? So much, much larger, but still a private company. So we basically did a, a share swap where we are owners now in, in Show Heroes. So it's not a true exit yet to, to answer your question because we haven't got cash back, mm -hmm. but we will see where that company goes. I think they're doing very well. I have a lot of respect for, for the entrepreneurs there. They've been doing it for a long, long time. Uh, I've met uh, both the, the founders and I think they're stand-up guys. So that's one example. Another example is actually the ones who are actually doing well and we want to sort of see how far they can go, right? I mentioned earlier this company called Global Ticks, right? And I would say that's one of the, we only have a few companies. So I would say that's one of the few stars in our portfolio, not the only star. Uh, these guys are both a travel software company, but also a travel marketplace. In fact, the marketplace is actually much bigger than the software piece of it. Now, marketplace dynamics are, are very interesting. If you look at a simple marketplace like an eBay or, or a Grab, the larger it grows, actually the more value it accrues, right? Because the more supply you get, the more demand you get. And the more demand you get, the more supply you get. So just sort of it's a rolling snowball, which, which means that in the early days, actually the value creation is actually not that much, right? Uh, in purely financial terms, I don't, I'm not talking about effort and all that. Yeah. In financial terms, actually it's just like that. It's growing, but the, the slope of the graph is sort of just, just like that. The larger it grows, the, the graph just starts to go sort of almost vertical, right? Yeah. So we've had offers for this company over the years several times. And the answer was always, okay, we, we'll talk to you. If you really put out a number that we cannot refuse, of course, we will we'll take that very seriously. But by and large, a marketplace accrues more over time than, than, than a traditional software business. So we would, by default, want to hold it, right? Second reason, of course, is that our fund was launched in end of 2018. Mm -hmm. So we still have, you know, several years to go before, you know, needing to, to sell. So unless there's a very strong reason for us to sell, we don't need to, right? So this company now, uh, you can imagine what COVID did. Uh, in COVID, they had basically zero revenues, right? So they had to rebuild the company. But comparing 
few months ago, I'm not giving you the latest results, comparing a few months ago to pre-COVID, they're actually three X bigger, three X bigger than pre-COVID and they're profitable, right? And this is despite uh, travel from China not having fully resumed, mm -hmm. right? In the old days, you know, uh, Chinese tourism was actually a big driver of, of their revenues. Now, without that, they're three X bigger, right? So it tells you how well they've architected the business. There's a massive gap between them and the number two player, the number three player, number four player, right? So again, in that regard, it becomes a very attractive asset uh, for people who are looking to say, look, I need to find you know, a place to, to expand my business into. Let's say you're a European company or a Chinese company or a US company, and you want to come to Southeast Asia. This is now the only asset worth considering seriously. And I said to you, we had offers for this company in the past. That action is only heating up now. Fantastic. So what sort of timeline do you think that uh, uh, this will happen? So this kind of thing is hard to predict. And I also, I, I'm very cognizant of the fact that this is going on you know, publicly. So I don't want to make promises that we cannot keep. But I would say broadly speaking, as I said, our fund was end of 2018. Uh, we're now in the year 2024, right? So we have roughly you know, four or five years left to go in the fund. So from just that standpoint, I think whether it be this company or any of other companies, we will start, you know, seriously evaluating options in the next, call it 18 months or so. That also gives these companies to accrue additional value. So it's not just about the funds timeline, right? For global ticks in particular or any other marketplace business in our, in our portfolio, the longer it goes, the more it accrues. And also one of the things, Morali, is this, you know, you've been investing since 2008. You've been through many cycles before. We are in a, a down cycle at the moment, but then, you know, it's a cycle. We are in the, you know, since 2021 was the peak where money was next to free, yes. obviously. And, and uh, when do you see looking ahead, I'm not asking you to do a crystal ball, but really it's around experience. When do you see the market turning? We are already mm. now in the second half of 2024. Mm. When are the purse strings going to start being loosened? And when do you see a real acceleration where VCs are really starting to then invest again? Mm. Got it. In 2021, you're right, market was very hot. We didn't do a single new investment then, right? So we try to be disciplined about that. Our thesis also has not changed, right? We've been consistent with our thesis. Yes, we've tweaked small elements of it, but by and large, it's the same. Timing-wise, interestingly, I just looked at the data maybe two, three weeks ago. Seed stage rounds are still happening in the, almost the same way as they used to, okay? Uh, maybe the number of firms operating in that area has gone down, but in, in terms of actual activity, I think it's not that different. The crunch has come more in the series A, B, and certainly beyond, right? So certainly yeah. B, C, D, very few deals happening, right? I think at least speaking purely from our personal, almost selfish perspective, that this is good for us and our portfolio companies, right? There are no more what I call tourists in the market, neither mm -hmm. investors nor founders. People who are here right now are serious, right? People who are actually operating right now really want to get a job done. So I'm very bullish right now in terms of investing in the companies from this cohort and the coming you know, year or two. I don't think for our sectors at least, capital is what they are lacking. And I don't think even if capital was available, that you necessarily want to take it, right? So I'm almost sort of questioning whether we should worry about when the market will turn, right? If but that will then morally impact your ability to exit because you need to roll out your fund, uh, close your, your initial fund. And if the market has then come back on, yep. obviously everyone will be looking at your valuations be completely different as compared to a down market. Yeah. No, I, I don't think that's completely true uh, because for one thing, we have the results. I've not shared some of the confidential results with you just yet to be able to raise money ourselves. We've been very successful at raising money for our second fund. Uh, we're still raising. If you, Brian, want to invest, you will happily you know, accommodate you. <laughs> Love to. Uh, but the second thing is, I think you, you made this point about if the market doesn't recover, where do the exits come from and so on? And here is where I would say our approach is different and suited to this kind of market, right? Okay. We end up owning fairly significant chunks of these companies. So we actually completely align with the founders in that we don't need to force them to 
raise 10, 50, 100 million dollars, and then eventually sell for a billion dollars, right? In those situations where companies are like that, the founders end up owning maybe five, ten percent of the company, ten if they're lucky, right? Yes. They can only make meaningful amount of money if they sell for five hundred and beyond, ideally a billion and beyond, right? And the same thing applies to their uh, investors. There's also liquidation preference tax sitting on top of them. If you raise a hundred million dollars or two hundred million dollars, that money has to be returned first before you, the founder, see a cent of of return, right? Exactly. In our portfolio, none of that is true, right? Our companies, again, Global Tech is a great example, raised $5 million over 10 plus years, right? They own a significant chunk of the business. They are bigger shareholders than us, right? So we're very, very aligned. So when these companies eventually want to exit and they sell for 200, 300, 400 million dollars, which is very achievable, we're all happy. We can all make money. And it does not depend on having to raise a lot more money you know, down the road. Murali, it's been a great conversation, a great catch up in terms of where you're at and where you see the market moving forward. Before you leave, any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? Look, I would say just when I, when I talk to entrepreneurs, I always say the same thing. Just focus on making sure you're running a fundamentally sound business, ideally financed by customer money. Forget the financial markets. That's not where the value actually gets derived. Ideally, you don't even want to come and talk to people like us. That's the best kind of business. Thank you very much for taking your time to be on the show, Murli. Wise you, advice. Bro. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. We've been speaking to Ms. Uh, Murli Ravi. He's the co-founder at Tinman Capital. I'm Brian Fernandez, and you've been watching and listening to Biztex Investor Conversation Show. This interview will be on our website, www.biztech.asia, as well as our syndication partners, TV stations, radio stations, and websites. Thanks a lot for tuning in.